Welcome to another Peaceful Solution Character Education Certification course. Everyone in the auditorium can be seated. Welcome to all of those watching online from many countries. We are glad you're joining us tonight, and thank you once again for allowing us the opportunity. We know we had to skip a day. We had a great event here for the Peaceful Solution, and of course, moving forward, we're hoping to uh, continue these classes throughout the rest of the year um, and, and get through this and into the RESPECT unit, and then we'll continue on into 2023 with these classes. I know there's a lot of people asking, um, what can they do for certification? Um, you know, the greatest thing to do is to apply and come here to the headquarters for certification. That has always been a dream that was established by the author and the board he established to uh, certify teachers all around the world, but you can watch online and we'll be more than glad to work with you and help you and answer your questions and get schools, yes, schools, get schools set up in your area where you can actually help children. And don't think when we're talking about schools, don't let it, don't let it absorb you in to where we're, you think we're talking about a university or you have to have a school of 800 people. If you can get a group of children together, young teens together, small group, that's fine. Get them together, we'll make sure you have the curricula, the things you need, and you can actually start. Everything starts small, you know, whether you're planting the seed in the garden or you're planting a tree or you're starting a peaceful solution work in your area. They start small and they grow out from there. But you first have to begin doing it. And that's the greatest challenge is, is starting it and achieving it. And it is possible. We've seen it all around the world with people establishing it and we've seen it where language barriers don't prevent it. Everybody wants to be part of learning this program. And we, once again, we welcome anyone that would like to join us. And our books are free. Um, if we have them, always, if you have any questions concerning them, you can always email us at info at peacefulsolution.org. Once again, that's info at peacefulsolution.org. Or you can just send a message to our Facebook page. And they'll be more than glad to respond back to you uh, very quickly. But we're picking up here in the self-control unit, and we're getting very close to the end here in chapter seven. And of course, last class, David was covering the air we breathe. And of course, Catan and William have also covered in detail. Um, and it's important that we all understand this, the detail where it gets down to the microscopic level. Because we tend to think that we can see everything that is going to hurt us, but if we can't see it, then we're free from danger. And that couldn't be further more from the truth. And we'll, we'll talk about that a lot more as we get into talking about the water we drink tonight. But once again, here on page 99, 199, this is where David left off. And he was talking about controlling the air. And he was telling us, like here in the very top paragraph, that clean air is essential to great health. You know, when you think about what we went through as a society, and of course you see here smog and acid rain, uh, which can lead to sickness and the destruction of forests and lakes. And it's not something society can afford to ignore. But, you know, then we have to get into see what's truly causing these things. And, you know, I had a very interesting conversation with a man one time, and he said, you know, they talk about all the exhaust fumes that are coming out of cars these days, destroying the ozone. He said, when I was young, we burnt fuel in the house for lights. And none of us had lung problems. We all did just fine. And we actually burnt fuel in the house. But now they're saying they've got exhaust coming out of cars, and that's destroying everything. He said it just doesn't make sense because we burned wood, we burned coal, and we burned oil, kerosene. Everything, everybody had kerosene lamps. And that's just the way life was. Now think about that. Those were all inside the house. You know, and then we think about, as we've talked about before on a global scale, um, we have volcanoes that erupt. Those have been going on since, you know, mankind recorded history. But you also have many other things that take place that haven't been since the beginning of history, such as nuclear radiation and the detonation of atomic bombs that we've seen and hundreds of atomic bomb, uh, bombs that have been detonated. We only think about the two that were dropped on Japan, but the tests are unlimited. And they're still talking today about testing more. And it always amazes me that everybody wants to reduce greenhouse gases, but no one's complaining about the testing of weapons that cause massive explosions that put many things into the atmosphere. You know, so think about those things as we move forward, because it is very important, as David was talking about, the EPA, also known as the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, he was talking about how corporations are created. And of course, corporations are there to govern 
and corporations operate on funding and of course all corporations have to balance their budget so to speak and he explained very uh, in a very realistic way on how the bottom line is what everybody's looking for you know and of course fines do not make your water clean um, cutting corners so to speak to get more water through water meters doesn't make your water cleaner um, in fact it actually it actually can destroy and break down not only the human body but the pipelines themselves as we see in Flint Michigan where they introduced a certain chemical into the pipeline and then they tried to pull water from another area and then everything that was harmful to the body that the pipeline was created from deteriorated under the chemicals that were put in supposedly to clean the water. It was very self-destructive. But these are things they're supposed to guide and watch over and protect against, but it's truly not helping. And you can see here in California at the end of the paragraph, uh, the second paragraph on page 199, it says, some states like California, for instance, offer incentives for people to carpool, thereby limiting the amount of cars on the road. Um, you know that you can reduce the exhaust and you can reduce the amount that's going out but if you reduce the traveling with no agenda going to and fro you know just out right around <laughs> you think about uh, the way we do things in society we'll go above and beyond to try to reduce a uh, hundred people doing something but we don't worry about the 10 million people that are doing something else and we're gonna get into that tonight because Society tends to focus on groups of people to solidify in their mind that these people are bringing the problems into society. And if they'll just listen to what we say, we'll be better off. Well, what are you going to do as a person? Well, I, I, I'm not doing anything to harm society. You know, I always laugh when I see the, uh, the uh, COP26 agreements they have over in Paris, and all of these world leaders fly on their fuel-consuming, exhaust-blooming jets, pouring out everything everywhere, and you think, why didn't you just have a Zoom meeting? Why could you not have just done Skype like everybody else does? We're teaching the world right now. We didn't fly any jets. In fact, we didn't fly many cars. I've seen people riding bicycles here today. You know, when you think about the excuses that are used, one of the most filthiest uh, events you'll ever see is a climate agreement meeting and the travel it takes to get there from countries. And it could be done with technology as it is today. But looking over here to page 200, and keep your finger there on page 200, because we're going to talk about the water, because the water and the air are tying together. Um, of course, the rain and where the water goes to, how it's dispersed, things that are put into it, the contaminants that are there, all of those things going hand in hand. So with your finger holding page 200, turn over to LP7D. LP7D and we're in procedure 5. Uh, David covered procedure 4 and then he covered page 199 which as he explained it's really not there in the lesson plan but that has to be covered before we get to procedure 5. And it says explain to students that we must consider our actions and how we treat our water supplies. Instruct students to read the section thirsty anyone found on page 200. Completing the exercise at the bottom of the page stress to students that Access to clean water improves the quality of life. Have students read the article found on page 203 and discuss the questions at the bottom of the page, or at the bottom, and then allow students to read just the facts on water pollution found on page 204. You know, and if we could go ahead and put up our first slide, when we think of clean water, you know, this is what everybody thinks of. Flowing streams from the top of the mountains and how it's so clear you can see to the bottom and growing up in North Carolina, I used to go to the Blue Ridge Parkway a lot. And there are many streams, just like you see, just like that on your monitor, where the water is so clear and is so cold and is so beautiful. And I've been from the streams from the top of the mountain and followed them all the way down to when they get into uh, one place is the Catawba River. And it's not so pretty after it gets so far. It starts getting pretty ugly after that but it starts getting ugly once it starts mixing in from natural water into water that's used for public sources. And that's when it starts really getting a little murky. But when you have water like that that's flowing, and if you've ever seen a stream coming off the top of a mountain, um, and if you've ever stuck your hands in it, 
uh, is some of the coldest water you'll ever fill. And it's, it's really fresh. The water's got, it's such a different water than what you drink from your tap. The closest thing I could think to it would be well water. But of course, everyone kind of thinks ideally that, well, that, that's exactly what we're getting right there. When we get our water out of the tap, that's where it comes from. It's so fresh, it's so clean. Um, everybody just wants to. You know, you come in from a hot summer day working outside, you get your ice, which is made with city water, or, you know, or some kind of water that uh, came out of this jug right here. They said it came from a spring in Arkansas. You know, I don't know why it says from the Dallas City Municipal Supply, but it said a spring in Arkansas. Um, you know, and that bottled water's become a big business. And when you think about it, I remember being in high school, and back then we only drank Gatorade when I played sports. We didn't even want it. We could even didn't even consider drinking water. And there was only two flavors: orange and lemon lime. That was it. And I remember the first time somebody brought bottled water out to the football field, and we laughed. We could not believe somebody would pay for water in a bottle. And it was kind of a running joke, but then it took off. And today, when you go to the gas station or service station to get a bottle of water, it'll cost you $2 or $3 for a bottle of water. Now imagine how much that's changed. And of course, what kind of water are you getting? Well, water's supposed to be healthy, but if we could look at the next slide before we get into page 200, this is something important to look at. You notice it says more than a third of Americans are at risk of losing affordable drinking water. Didn't say clean drinking water, said affordable drinking water. Right now, the average water bill for most people in the United States is about $120 a month if you're on the city municipal supply. I've talked to people in the last week that their water bills were three to $400 for one month. Let your toilet start dripping or leaking, let the seal go bad, you're gonna get a huge water bill. We've seen news reports here in Abilene where people had $18 and $1,900 water bills just because they had a leaky faucet or something that was leaking and they didn't know of it. And what the city municipal supply will do is they'll actually, if you call a plumber and they come out and say, yeah, it was leaking and fix it, they'll give you some kind of, uh, they call it a grace relief to where they remove some of the funding. But we haven't said anything about clean water. This is just affordable water. Now, if you're somebody that's privileged to have a well, that's very different because I know people that have wells that, you know, they run on solar, take no electricity whatsoever and pull the water straight out of the ground. But when you live in an area that has drought, you can lose your wells too if you don't manage your water very well. So think about that. Just getting water, once again, we haven't said it's clean and you see there on the map, uh, high track or high risk tracks you see in the blue and you see the southeast part of the United States is completely covered which is usually a very wet part of the United States you would think water would be in abundance and then you have high risk tracks and the lighter kind of the bluish gray color and it covers pretty much the rest there's a very small part that's not in some kind of trouble of, of facing unbelievable water cost once again we haven't said anything about clean water cost and that was provided by uh, Vox, which was from a uh, study done by Michigan State University. But here looking over to page 200, we have straight talk. And it says, daily activities such as heating our homes, driving our cars, and even burning charcoal for barbecue will produce some pollution. It's very important to remember. And if you are someone that is still referring to oil or fuel as fossil fuel, please educate yourself in this. Science has come a long way since the books that I read back in the 1980s and 1990s in high school and even starting in the 1970s. Um, as scientists and people that work in the oil business, here in Abilene, we're just 180 miles from the Permian Basin, which there is an enormous amount of oil out there for the West Texas crude that you see on the stock market. And there's a lot of oil fields out there at the Permian Basin, an enormous amount, billions of uh, barrels of oil out there. And they'll tell you very quickly, these are not dinosaurs, the earth generates this oil. They'll tell you in Saudi Arabia, this is a product that the earth itself is creating. It fills the wells. It's just like the aquifer where your water wells fill up, the oil wells are the same way. And you can go online and you will find many people that will tell you no, this doesn't come from dead dinosaurs. It's just a term that's still being used, but it's a very deceptive term. 
You know, they're saying fossil fuel, but it really doesn't come from a fossil. The earth is actually generating this from the inside and it comes to the surface and it's generating it. But the earth, we have to imagine the earth as, if you can imagine the earth, not as we've done a great job in separating ourselves from Americans and Russians and Chinese and Koreans and, uh, you know, we have Venezuelans and then we'll, we'll just divide ourselves enormously. And then Africa, they just get, no matter what country you're from in Africa, they just throw you, they talk about Africa just like it's one country. They forget how many countries are actually in Africa. But when you start putting this all together, because we all live on this earth, the earth is like one operating component. It has many, many different um, operating systems inside that one operating component. And of course, you also have the moon, which works with the earth in doing certain things. But if you can imagine the Earth, the way it works, and please, if you've never took Earth science or read or studied any of this, look into it. The Earth can process pretty much what we put into it when we put things into it within reason. The Earth can process uh, pollution within reason. In other words, the Earth can process the burning of wood stoves. The Earth can process the burning of coal, the burning of fuel, the earth can process many things like that. The earth cannot process the detonation of nuclear weapons. That will kill a lot of things that are on the earth that are actually here, as the teachers before me have talked about, and processing things on a microscopic level. And when you start killing those things off, you have to rejuvenate them somehow. You know, you can't kill off everything and expect everything to work. Because if you, if you can imagine, um, you know, and, and, and David referred to the microbes as the bugs, you know, and, and I think he did a great job of explaining it. If you imagine anything in your life that you use a lot, and all of a sudden come, somebody comes by and wipes that out completely, just say, think about the fire department. Just think if somebody came through and wiped away every fire department, and then you had a house fire, and you were so used to calling 911, the fire department coming, oh, they'll save my house. All of a sudden, there's you call, but there's no fire department anymore. Well, whenever we start polluting the earth in very toxic ways that start eliminating certain microbes that process and do jobs, well, the earth becomes sick, just like we do. When things get into our body, you know, little bugs get into our body, and, you know, viruses, uh, the flu's going around right now, COVID, you know, talk about the air we breathe. Um, that's one of the greatest pollutants right now going around, or flu, RSV and COVID. But when you think about how all of us interact with each other and how everything is interdependent, when we start destroying the things we can't see because we think they're not important, it's the things we can't see that also end up taking our lives on a very microscopic level. But here, once again, back on page 200, it says, society has not yet found a way to live without polluting the environment to some degree. It's important to remember that to live within uh, our means is the most important thing we can do. By controlling the amount of pollution that is put into the air, raising the awareness of, public, of the public to become more uh, conservation-minded and setting standards of what is acceptable, we as society are practicing self-control and making positive choices to take better care of our environment. You know, and I've had people, well, how can I do something that uh, will help me to control the environment? You know, and one thing, I, I knew a person one time that when it was cold in the winter, here in Texas, sometimes you can have it at 30 degrees in the morning, and by midday, you're at 50, and by, you know, 4 o'clock, you're at 75, 80 degrees. They would run the heater all day, and when it got hot, they would open the door and open windows. The heater's still running. You know, and I walked in one day, and I said, you know, you can turn the heater off. You don't have to open up all the doors to... You know, and I've seen people run the heater and air conditioner at the same time. Those are things that we can control and do a little bit better, you know, uh, controlling the way we, we use water. If we just let it run for no purpose whatsoever, then we're just too lazy to turn it off. You know, there's many things we can do within reason that would help prolong a lot of things. Not being wasteful. Not being wasteful and being mindful how we do things is the most important thing we can do to be a conservationist. Um, thinking that we need to eradicate every car off the road that burns fuel 
it sounds very interesting when it's talked about on the news until you see an electric car catch on fire and they realize they can't put it out because the batteries don't put out very easily. And you realize there's a lot more going on. And in California, they realized here recently when they had a huge energy demand with air conditioners, they didn't have enough supply to charge electric cars there. So they talk about, and they want you to buy these things that they're really not prepared for. It would have been like Henry Ford, you know, when he got with Rockefeller, and they one had petroleum and the other one had the car and they put everything together to bring them make them work the car was worthless without the gas station and the gas station wasn't very important without the car well the same thing with electric cars not condemning or putting down electric cars in any which way shape or form but you have to have a couple things to make them work you know you just don't ride around with a solar panel on the top of your electric car it just doesn't work that way which solar panels are a great thing also but here we're going to talk about this water. And we looked at the very beginning, that picture of the stream and how beautiful it is. And we tend to think that, man, that's the way, that's the way it is everywhere. Well, it's not like that in Texas. I remember the first time I went to a lake out here, they called Fort Phantom. I thought that was the most disgusting thing I've ever seen in my life. It was red. And then after reading, I found out that it has a current that constantly turns the red clay out there and it actually keeps the water pretty clean because the clay will absorb in bacteria and other things. But it didn't look very nice. You know, the, the water I came from in North Carolina looked nicer, but it was full of who knows what. Uh, and some things I do know what because they ran the city sewer out in it. And people would go swimming in it. And they'd go fish in it. And they'd go do a lot of other things in it. But when you start looking around the world, and I know there's people watching in Africa right now, especially if you get up into the Horn of Africa around Somalia, you get down into Yemen where typhoid is rampant, you start getting into southern Sudan and Sudan itself, and you get into some of these poor countries, or you get down into countries that are just absolutely beautiful. You know, you get down into the South America or down in Mexico, you get out to the Yucatan Peninsula. You know, that's where you have Cancun and Cozumel and then you can get down into just beautiful places in Latin America. And we've been to South America before. And water's not so readily available and clean for everyone. And that's supposed to be developed areas. We're not talking about, everybody thinks of Africa when they think of underdevelopment. And then you don't have to go but get on I-20 and go east 600 miles and just end up in Jackson, Mississippi and ask them how the water's going right now. They're still suffering from a very tainted water supply. And if you think they're complaining, take a trip up to Flint, Michigan and ask them how their water problem's going. It still has not been rectified. They're still suffering from what has taken place. And this is here in the United States where we spend hundreds of billions of dollars on war, but we can't find a way to produce clean water. We lose in the track to even perform, uh, give out affordable water, much less clean water. You know, and if you've never if you've never had the privilege of talking to someone from a country where they have no idea what a water faucet is. In fact, they don't even know what a hand pump is that we had back in the 1800s where you'd set out there in the 19, early 1900s, you'd pump your water. They don't know what that is. To them, it's a stick with two buckets on the end and you walk about two or three miles, you load up those buckets and you walk back home. And we've had the privilege of having uh, peaceful solution teachers who will go out to these villages with satellite phones and we're able to talk to those people and there's nothing more encouraging than talking to people that money means absolutely nothing to them you know farming food they barter they trade US dollar I've never seen one <laughs> don't know don't even know why I need to see one they're not caught up into those things but the problem is when the drought comes for them so does the disease and the bacteria if we go to the next slide, this is something you might not know. The slides aren't pretty, but the facts are true. Dirty water is dangerous. Every year, 3,575,000 people die from water-related disease. This is equivalent to a jumbo jet crashing every hour. Most of these people are children, 2.2 million. Now this is life for a lot of people, not just here in the United States. And looking over at our next slide, really dangerous, 
unclean water and poor sanitation have claimed more lives over the past 100 years than any other cause. The water crisis claims more lives through disease than any war through guns. Think about that. Here are people just drinking. And if you know anybody that can get it, get by without water, you know, fine, let me know. We'll start looking at everything that you consume that has water, from the things you eat to the things you drink, you know, and try to get by without it. And then going over to the next slide, safe drinking water is a luxury. 844 million people lack access to safe drinking water. This is more than the com combined populations of the United States, Brazil, Japan, Germany, France, and Italy. That's how many people actually lack accessibility, which means they don't have a way to get it. They got water, but it's not clean water. There's a lot of places where the cows, the goats, and the humans all drink from the same puddle. One more, going to the next one. Dirty water is making many people sick. At any given time, half of the world's hospital beds are occupied by patients suffering from a water-related illness. And when you think about water-related illnesses, um, if you've listened to the news a lot, you hear a lot about typhoid, especially over in Yemen. That's been in the news an enormous amount because of their water supply is so horrendous right now. And that's something that comes through the getting a bacteria in from the water into the body. You drink it in. And it leads to severe diarrhea in the body. And once again, in the United States you get it, you think, oh, that's not a big deal. I'll take something and get rid of it. It'd be okay. Imagine living in a country and contracting something like that as a death sentence, where it's the third leading cause of death. Where people would rather have, you know, tell me I got malaria than I got, you know, typhoid at least malaria, which is more or less the flu, um, tell me I got that. At least I got a better opportunity of living. Looking at the next slide, this is the really shocking fact that I thought, and all of these came from the watercounts.com, or excuse me, the world counts, the worldcounts.com. You can actually go onto that website, and I'm not here to advertise for them, but they have a counter clock where they count how many people die per day from uh, filthy water not having access to clean water. But dirty water causes the death of a human being every 10 seconds. You know, every 10 seconds, it causes the death. And going to the next slide, you know, we, we look at these things on a microscopic level, and this is something that is very common here in the United States. It's called Legionnaire's disease. And of course, it's very common to get this through the water here in the United States. It's making a comeback, actually, once again. This is just one thing. And when you look at that, that's through a microscope, and it's been just blown up enormously where we can see it. But you know, when you're getting water, you don't see it. You don't get to see it. You can't taste it. And you can't feel it. To act, it starts growing within you. And once it starts growing and processing, that's when we start realizing, no, oh, we probably shouldn't be doing this. We should be doing something different. But you know what? It's too late for many, many people once it gets to that point. And what the Peaceful Solution is trying to bring out through all of this, talking about being a conservationist and not polluting, is we need to stop putting things that you could use the word defile, you could use the word contaminate, you could use the word poison, we need to quit doing things that are harming society and not caring because it's not us it's affecting. We actually need to start caring for everybody. You know, if we have clean drinking water, society should care more about the 844 million that do not have clean drinking water than dropping one bomb on a country that has clay huts. It makes no sense and shows no care and concern when we as a society put more money into the killing of the human race than the preserving of the human race. One last fact to look at on the next slide. And it says some 829,000 people are estimated to die each year from diarrhea. Imagine almost a million people dying for something as simple as diarrhea as a result of unsafe drinking water, sanitation, and hand hygiene. 
and that was released on March 21st of 2022. Once again, all of the information comes from the worldcounts.com, and their source for information is the World Health Organization, and they label it and list it there for everyone to see. But, you know, just imagine. Uh, imagine living in a country to where you, you just could not go turn on a faucet. You see here on the page where it says thirsty and when you see the water faucet there, you know, I was growing up as a young boy, when we wanted water outside, we just went up to the water hose, turned it on, and we just put it up to our face, and we drank straight out of the water hose, didn't think anything about it. As I've gotten older, I've met people that have never heard of a water hose. They have no idea what a faucet is. And running water, they have no idea what that means either. You know, unless it all you, yeah, me run to go get, yeah, sure, okay. And you think about how spoiled we are here in the United States. Well, think about that as we go through some of these other statistics and when you think about what you have well how can we do things for others and getting organizations together collecting hundreds of millions of dollars and paying CEOs you know 40 million dollar salaries so they can sit on a board is worthless creating um, let me just say the World Health Organization already exists, the UN already exists, the Red Cross already exists, the Salvation Army already exists, many other faith-based organizations already exist who collect hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars for these problems, and the statistics I just gave you are from this year. Where is all the money going? Where is the care and concern for these people? to say, well, they shouldn't live in that part of the world. Is that what we tell Japan? Well, you shouldn't have lived in that part of the world. You wouldn't have suffered the atomic bomb. Is that what we tell Syria? Well, if you didn't live in that part of the world, we wouldn't be stealing your oil. We'd be stealing someone else's oil. We have to think about what we're doing globally. And as Americans, I'm not here on some kind of political motivation speech. We have to start thinking about why does the world not like us very much. And if you think the world doesn't like you as an American, you're not talking to people that's outside of the United States. Um, America, people have a huge dist distaste for Americans right now. Uh, and it's sad because most Americans don't want to hurt anyone. A lot of people are taking the peaceful solution globally, and they just want peace. They don't want war. But that's not what we're seeing. And, of course, there's a thing called water wars. A lot of information out there on water wars, and if you haven't ever watched it, it would be great for you to get your class together and to watch some documentaries uh, where they're called water wars. Well, nations literally go to war over water. But continuing here on page 200 on the thirsty anyone topic, it says, hopefully you live in an area where there's plenty of clean water. You know, we're very thankful here. The area we live in is mostly well water. That's what we're drinking. Um, so we're very thankful for that. Although 70% of our planet's uh, surface is water, only a small percentage of it is suitable for human beings to use. The United Nations now says that some 1.2 billion people around the globe live without access to safe water. There are 2.5 billion without sanitization who are vulnerable to disease ranging from diarrhea to typhoid and insect uh, borne Ill illnesses. The pollution of our waters, like the pollution of the air, has the potential to affect all life on our planet. You know, and these statistics, statistics, of course, were recorded in 2003, 4, and 5 that are in this book. And to give you an example, uh, myself and quite a few other Peace of Solution teachers, we've traveled to different parts of the world. And one time we traveled to Jamaica. And we were there to teach. We were not there for vacation. We didn't go to the resorts. We didn't go to where all the beautiful things were at. We kind of thought Jamaica was just beautiful everywhere. We thought, that's going to be great. And then when we got off the plane in Kingston, we were kind of like, oh, it must get prettier the farther you get from the airport. And Kingston's the capital, like Washington, D.C. is in the United States. And then we noticed the water where the cargo ships were at. It's like, where's all this beautiful, clear blue water supposed to be here? And then you start seeing people, the interstate, what I would call an interstate, was built by the Chinese. And it was very nice, but that was the only thing. And in the media, if you can imagine the media of an interstate being, you know, the width of two football fields all the way, and people living in the center. Huge amounts. I'm talking thousands and thousands and thousands of people. 
in like just shanty towns, small villages. And all of their houses are made with corrugated steel, rusted. You could tell it was used three, four times. They've used it to make houses. Their climate is neutral, so they don't have extreme hot. They don't have extreme cold, but they have extreme wet. But they were all living in the center. And that was just one village. We've seen many like this. And we were traveling with some really great teachers that we, friends we've had for a long time in Jamaica. And we traveled all the way from uh, Kingston up to Ocho Rios, which is the north side. You can drive from the bottom to the top of Jamaica in an hour, an hour and a half. And as we were traveling, I'm looking, and I asked him, I said, I, I, where do these people go to the bathroom? There's thousands of people that live there. There's no way they have a sewer system in that place. And he pointed over to the drain system. And the drain system was huge. And this is when the, the hurricanes and the, the tropical storms come in. This is what gathers the water so it doesn't flood out the people. And these were huge, enormous. You could put, just imagine putting football stadiums into these drainage systems. They were enormous, all concrete. And he pointed, I noticed on the side, people just go to the side of the drainage system. And there's all the feces and all the urine just going down the side. You just walk over there, and that's where you do it, and you walk back across, and that's where, you, that's where you're at. Or you fill up a jug, and you take the jug over, and you pour the jug down, and that's how they do it, and that's considered acceptable. And as we went through teaching there from Spanish Town and other towns there in Jamaica, we finally got to the edge of the resorts where the Americans and many other people come. And we were able to get on a sky lift that took us up really high up in the air, a cable sky lift where we could see everything. There we seen absolutely beautiful, clear water. Everything was so perfect and pristine. That was the Jamaica that I'd seen online and I'd seen on the postcards and I'd seen where everybody talked about Jamaica. But there were no Jamaicans living there. There were the Jamaicans working there, but they were not living there. But that's where all the tourists go. And I thought, you know, if we were to went there, we would have, I would have left thinking Jamaica was just this beautiful place. Everybody here enjoys life. But no, Jamaica is a really hard place. And when you think about, why do I bring that up? Because when you go to the top part, the northern part, where you have Montego, Otorio, St. Anne's Bay, all of those things, very beautiful. But that's not really life in Jamaica. That's not really what those people are going through down there. And that's just one place. There's numerous places that are like that. But most Americans have no idea. You can go to the country and leave the country and still have no idea what people are going through. Well, we need to consider and think about if we want to use people's countries for our vacations, we should care about them more than just, you know, a weekend or a week, you know, seven days. Well, I spent my seven days there. They owed me that. No, they didn't. You were a guest in their country. Imagine what a guest does when you come and leave. Well, looking down here, uh, water, this is the next paragraph. The water, like air, is essential to life. All organisms are made up of large percentages of water. Water is found in rivers, oceans, lakes, as vapor, in the atmosphere, and even underground. You know, and here it says to list some of the things that are different ways you use water. And, of course, when you list them here, you know, I think most people would say bathe. No matter what country you live in, if you're bathing, you got some form of water you're using. Wash the car. I talked to uh, some people here in uh, Lima, Peru, not long ago, and we were talking about the difference between the United States and Lima, Peru, which I did not realize that Lima, Peru has over 9 million people that live in that city. It's bigger than New York City. And they were shocked when they said, well, here about 30 percent of people have a car most people walk i was like oh not in the united states in the united states most people have a car they drive everywhere that was shocking to them you know and you think washing the car to us is normal not to most people washing clothes uh, i know a lot of people that still use washboards they don't have washing machines that that it means nothing to them to say washing machine of course, cook, you have people that use electric, natural gas, propane, and wood. Drink, not everybody has access to clean drinking water. To care for animals, most people, you know, animals can process water and the bacteria in it a little bit better than humans can. Wash hands, sadly, not everyone cares to use water for that, do they? 
Um, you can find that out just by swabbing things. We've talked about that before. Clean the house. Well, if you have a house to clean, um, we have a group in Kenya that their school is made up of mud and straw. And that's a house. And it's very interesting because the roof is also straw. And it's always interesting to see how things are done in different countries. We tend to think everybody has what we have. Uh, not really. Well, to swim, uh, when you go into swimming and you want to find out about microscopic uh, problems in water, in the United States, you can very readily go in and type in amoeba. Uh, every year, we just had it in the news again here not long ago, a young child died from getting an amoeba through the nose into the brain and dying from water that was just pond and standing there, and they went swimming in it. Because it wasn't moving, it wasn't circulating, bacteria grows. Um, you know, and, and discuss these things with your students, because I think this last one took place, it was either in northern Texas or Arkansas, somewhere around in there. An amoeba, usually you die. It's very rarely that someone survives from getting an amoeba into the brain. Of course, making ice rings or making drinks such as lemonade or soda. You know, all of those are things that we, we in the United States, we can relate to everything that was just said there. But you won't relate to that everywhere else you go. It's not as common as you think. It's not as prevalent as you think. You know, if you want something in the United States, you go to a Walmart. Go to a Walmart in Argentina. We've been there. There's, it, it looks the same from the outside. When you go to the inside, boy, is it totally different. It's not the same. And then, of course, when you go down, um, when I go into Mexico, even the people there won't drink the water that comes out of the faucet. They tell you, no, nah, <laughs> bring bottled water. That's one of the most requested things I get. Well, TVs and bottled water. That's the two most requested things I get. Uh, I bring bottled water. I don't worry with the TVs. I'm not a TV salesman. But when you're going through and processing these things and you're looking at these things, there's some things that do affect us all. And looking over here to page 201, it says, Water pollution is a major problem in, to, uh, in the world today, and according to the Center for Disease Control, is responsible for over 900,000 illnesses and approximately 1,000 deaths per year. That's in the United States alone. Now, this is supposed to be the leading nation of all nations when it comes to tech technology, even though... We know that when it comes to certain things, China is more advanced. Uh, some things, South Korea is more advanced, and in some things, China is more advanced. But when it comes to water, the United States is supposed to be the leading example. Well, on a global scale, billions of people are affected by polluted water. Disease such as dysentria and typhoid results in the death of approximately 3 million children annually. The latest report that just came out was 2.2 million. Uh, polluted water is responsible for the deaths of thousands of aquatic animals as well as birds. In addition uh, to this, water pollution has been linked to cancer, birth defects, and both human and animal population. Once again, you have to consider the water itself doesn't do this. It's other things that have gotten into the water that is causing this. And the question becomes, how did these things get into the water? Why did they get into the water? How were they allowed into the water? So keep that in mind as we move forward. It says, you learned in the previous section about air pollution that acid rain pollutes water. However, there are many other ways that waters are polluted, and here's some examples. And keep in mind, when the rain falls from the sky, where did it start at? You have evaporation that creates rain clouds, right? It's just a circulation. It keeps going around and around and around. And if you put enough trash into your water supply, it doesn't matter how big your oceans are, you start polluting enough, you're going to have a lot of toxicity in the environment, in the environment, throughout the atmosphere. Here you see flooding causes untreated sewage, animal waste, garbage, antifreeze, and oil products that have leaked from cars to flow directly into our waters. You know, and you can see that a lot, but most of the time, when you see an enormous amount, and this is very common if you've ever lived on the East Coast and been part of hurricanes, they just had this in Florida. Uh, and you don't think about this when you're watching the news and you see people walking through the streets and they're wearing their waders and they got the water up to their waist. One thing that you learn if you live there, whenever the floods come, one of the first things that floods is the city sewage supply. And the water gets in and raw sewage is everywhere. And if the TV was scratch and sniff, most of those people would not be walking in there. If you watched it, you'd be throwing up if you could actually smell what people are walking through. They just had that also in California where they had flooding 
come through and then the sewage washed out onto the beach. Did they close the beach? No, just put up a sign that said swim at your own risk. You know, also remember the city in the United States that is labeled with the dirtiest water, amazingly enough, is not Flint, Michigan, or Jackson, Mississippi. It's Pensacola, Florida. That is labeled as the number one filthiest water city in the United States. The number one uh, with the cleanest water is listed as Macon, Georgia, because they have a huge lake there, and it's uh, they keep it pretty uh, away, pretty much away from commercial productive uh, systems. But you're talking about untreated sewage. Um, untreated sewage. That means they haven't ran the chemicals so you can drink it again. That's what it means by untreated sewage. In other words, they haven't got the solids out to where they can run it back through your water faucet. If you don't understand what that means any more than that, just look it up. You'll see it. Or go back and watch our previous classes. And then, of course, you have millions of gallons of oil are spilled into the ocean every year. This comes from tanker accidents, offshore drilling, and routine maintenance. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that right there was a very huge thing when I was in high school. That's the Exxon Valdez spill. And that was huge in the news when that took place. And you see the oil that has leaked out of that tanker and of course it's all over the place it looks small because it's so far up in the air the pitcher but you see the oil that is all over the water and of course it's it's spreading now it's very small compared to the ocean itself and you look over to the next picture and you can see even more how you have the very the beautiful blue water and then you have the oil there where it's leaking out it's coming out that one went to shore and it ruptured and here goes the oil leaking out but one thing that's amazing, and I challenge everyone to, to, to check this out and, and research it. There was an oil spill by BP that was off the Gulf of Mexico, and it got up onto the ocean, you know, the ocean it got onto the beaches. And when they went to process and clean it, somehow the system itself was able to process. They didn't have that much to clean up. And go back and research, because they said, the one man commented, the beaches were the cleanest they've ever been. This was after an oil spill. You know, these things are created by the earth. Now, what do they affect? Well, there are some things they affect, and, and of course, they fall victim to it. If you go to the next picture, this is what environmentalists will show you pictures of. And of course, this is a sad fact of things that take place when you have animals that suffer due to this. Um, they have natural oil on themselves, but of course, they can't process things like this. But I remember the person for the Exxon Valdez I remember when he uh, was arrested, it was found out that he had been drinking. Uh, they arrested him, they processed him. You hear people, oil spills, it just makes the news, they, they just talk about it, they tell you how bad they damage the environment. Um, we just read about how untreated sewage will just destroy things because it's leaking. Now, you have to tell me how it leaks from cars or anything like that. I mean, I've had motorhomes. You know, untreated sewage usually comes from natural disasters such as hurricanes or so forth or there's one other way that you're getting ready to see that nobody's complaining about it there's no environmentalists stomping their foot um, if you can show the next slide this is one of the most common ways sewage gets dumped into our water supply these are cruise ships and you see they're dumping the raw sewage off to come to shore to replenish with fresh water and a lot of people don't realize that these ships are known for dumping this. And if you've ever watched the tide come in, you're setting up and you're, you're on the beach and you're watching the tide come in at night, and you watch, man, that water will come in 30 or 40 foot from where it was midday. Well, what's it bringing in? Well, those cruise ships dump just a couple miles off. And, of course, here's another picture. Now, this is an exaggerated picture, but it gives you an idea of what's being done. If you could go to the next slide... A lot of the waste that is hauled by cruise ships is dumped into the ocean, especially the Pacific. There's a well-known, uh, they call it uh, plastic island, was one phrase that I heard for it, that's bigger than the United States. It's out in the Pacific. But a lot of trash is dumped by commercial use. It's just dumped there. Why? Why can it not be processed a different way? And when you imagine what's being dumped through the sewer of a ship, um, and if you could imagine everything is flushed down the toilet and your mind can run wild when everything is flushed down the toilet 
is now dumped off in the ocean, which is washing to shore. And if you think it doesn't make it to shore, go online and read about the amount of fecal bacteria that's in the sand of the United States, uh, beaches in the United States. I live in the United States, so I'm mentioning the United States. And if you think they do it way off the coastline, if you could pull up the next slide, that's not very far off the coastline. And of course, it was reported it was sediment that they stirred up, but after the scientists went in and tested the water, it wasn't sediment, it was uh, sewage. They just dumped it. Um, you know, when you're busy and you're in a rush and you're running a business, you just gotta do some things the right way, I guess, right? But look how close that is to the, uh, I'm sure it's an outer part in, in, the United, in North Carolina, we'd call it part of the Outer Banks, but you're dumping thousands of gallons of stuff that's gotta be processed right there. People are living there. A lot of these things that I'm showing you, I'm trying to say they're self-inflicted. We're doing this to ourselves. These are not problems to where, you know, no one said anything about the exhaust of the cruise ship or the disease that is kind of spread on the cruise ship and no one said anything about the sewage being dumped off the cruise ship and here's something else that you might not realize uh, but we'll read this uh, statistic right here or the, the bullet point where it said merchant ships deliberately dump millions of pounds of garbage including human waste and plastic products directly into our oceans and seas each year uh, that was just some pictures for you to see and then the next one is Toxic chemicals and radioactive waste, some of which are flammable, are dumped into the ocean, lakes, and rivers. You know, and I had a student one time say, you can dump something flammable into the ocean? Well, if you can show our next slide, you can literally have a fire in the ocean. And this was off the Gulf of Mexico. In fact, that was off the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, that would be where you have Cancun and Cozumel. Um, this was off where a natural gas pipeline had burst. It was a 12-inch natural gas pipeline had burst. And notice what they're doing. They're shooting water onto the fire that's in the middle of the water. You know, and you think about, well, you, would it burn itself out? What would take place? How did it take place? Uh, it's kind of amazing to see that these things would actually take place. But they do. Um, and things, you know, things die from that. But looking on to the next one, we see pesticides used by gardeners and uh, the agricultural industry as well as animal waste seep into the underground water supply or run directly into rivers, lakes, and streams contaminating drinking water. Not just drinking water. If you've ever had E. coli from uh, you know, lettuce or spinach, most of the time that's contaminated water that had fecal matter that spread into the food as it grows. Listeria, when you get into things like that, or E. coli is not really spread in the market as much as it is the farm it was grown. And they can find, trace it all the way back to where it comes from. We just had a huge problem here in Texas, it wasn't that long ago, with bacteria that was on lettuce. And a few people died. And it was traced all the way back to Chihuahua, Mexico. And when they traced it back, they had realized that the farmers that were growing the commercial lettuce had used water with human waste. And that's where the bacteria, because it was in the human waste. When they sprayed it onto the leaves, they grew it. They kind of incubated it, and then they sold it. But you know what? You couldn't see it. You couldn't smell it. You couldn't taste it. You ate it, and you got sick, and some people died. But you also have where you get industrial chemicals. Florida has seen this recently also, to where you get a lot of nitrogen and a lot of phosphate mixed together. And if you show the next slide, um, now if you go back to the slide before that, that's where you have, you see the algae bloom growing off the coast there. That comes from the commercial chemicals that have washed off the mainland through rivers and streams, carries on out into the ocean, and when it opens up into the ocean, you get huge algae bloom. And you can see there, it's taking over a lot of the water. And you go to the next slide, you can see the algae that's growing on the, uh, that's really on the rocks and the plants. It looks like water, but it's not. It's a really thick, kind of pasty substance. And they even have what they call red algae bloom there in Florida. It looks like blood. And that's, you can take your, it's best to take your students, and, and these videos are readily available on YouTube. There's unlimited news sources that reported on these things and are still reporting to this day about these things, about how it's due to what we've done. These are self-inflicted uh, harming, ways of harming ourselves. If you were to look at this and say someone died from this and it was self-inflicted, 
You would, you know, you would either have to label these things as murder or suicide. But we're doing it to ourselves or we're doing it to someone else. These are not things that are sneaking up on us and jumping on us. And nothing I've showed you has to do with the burning of exhaust from a car. There's many more ways that we're destroying the earth. And all they talk about is fossil fuels, which are not really fossil fuels to begin with. So think about that moving forward here. Look over to page 202. We really want to cover this because there's a great example here um, to close out the class tonight. It says, as you can see, water can be accidentally polluted during floods or deliberately polluted with garbage and toxic substances and deliberately dumped into our waters. We've seen it both ways. You know, accidentally would be from like hurricanes and so forth. The deliberate polluting demonstrates disregard for the value of life and the preservation of the environment. Of course, you see here uh, the turtle looking up and say, so, there are people who pollute our waters on purpose? Well, it sure smells like a lack of self-control. And yeah, it would smell like a lack of something, that's for sure. But here's something to keep in mind. Yes, this is an example of how a lack of self-control regarding the environment can endanger everyone. Think of it like this. It's one thing to slip on the kitchen floor and spill a glass of milk. It's another thing to pour the glass of milk onto the floor because you don't want to walk to the sink. Either way, the milk is on the floor, but deliberately pouring it shows an uncaring attitude. In the same manner, deliberately dumping pollutants into our water shows a lack of concern on the part of any individual or organization. In 1969, the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland, Ohio was so polluted with hazardous flammable waste that it caught fire and burned. Sort of like what we've seen through the uh, part that was there off the Yucatan Peninsula of the Mexican Gulf, in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And it says some things are easier to prevent than to correct. You know, we'll get into next class. We're going to build off this water. There's an article that we'll bring and show um, where they say that you can actually say that every person that lives in London is actually on cocaine. And they, may, they say it in a laughing way. And it's not just cocaine. It's opioids and other things because there's so much drug use, not just illegal, but also through pharmaceutical, that the city municipal supply water actually tests positive for drugs. And people don't realize when someone is on medication, you don't have to dump the bottle of pills down to put it in there. You just have to expel the water from your body, and that's how most medication is dumped into the city water supply. And, of course, you know, when I was growing up, if you have leftover prescription drugs, just dump it down the toilet and flush it. Like that wasn't going anywhere, right? It went straight to the city water supply. Well, think about these things. And, of course, uh, moving forward, we're going to pick up on page 203 with our next class and talk about uh, some things that dealt with the Mississippi and also getting into more about water pollution and the damage it's already done. But what can we do as instructors of the Peaceful Solution and students of the Peaceful Solution to fix these problems? So our next class is going to be on 11-2. So it'll be uh, November the 2nd, and it'll be at 5.30 once again uh, this Wednesday afternoon or evening. So thank you for joining us once again, and we look forward to joining you at that time.